church.
clap this morning, church. Come on, give him a hand clap this morning, church. Hallelujah. Well, you better get used to it, church. Because for eternity, we're going to praise his name. For eternity, we're going to join the chorus of holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. We're going to do it for eternity, church. Sometimes I don't understand. It's like, do you know him, church? Because when I get in his presence, nothing else matters. No, nothing else matters right now. Nothing else matters. It's the taste of heaven. It's the peace of heaven we have on this side, church. You know, he taught us how to pray. He said, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He's given us a sign, church, because if he just wanted you to be in heaven with him, the moment you, you accepted him, he'd have snatched you right out. But instead, he left you here. And you have purpose this morning, church. But we get to taste heaven when we join together in the house of God with the people of God lifting up the praises of God. He's worthy of our praise, church. And you might as well get used to worshiping the Lord because we're going to do it forever and ever and ever. And he's worthy. Would you bow your heads with me? Lift your hands to him this morning, church. Let's worship him with all we have today. Father God, we love you because you first loved us. Thank you, Jesus. And we glorify you and magnify you in this place. Let continual praise happen here in Jesus' name. Someone shout amen. amen. The heavens declare your greatness and power. Creation proclaims the work of your hands. Holy, holy, holy. Your people sing out, exalting your name. Jesus is Lord, forever he reigns. Holy, holy, holy. He is our King. He is our King, worthy of honor and praise. He is our God, yeah. He is our God, awesome and mighty to save.
since we've been here. And it's good, as the Bible says, to be in the house of the Lord, to lift his name, to honor him, and praise him and give him all the glory, church. I want you, right now, lift your hands to the Lord. And I want you to raise a shout of praise and honor to the King of glory, the Lord of heaven and earth. solo and I would sing it and our church would just go wild <laughs> amen it's called blessed quietness that's not talking about verbal quietness it's talk about a peace and a and a, a calmness the Holy Spirit gives to us even though things are going on on the outside and there's trouble all around we can have blessed quietness oh holy quietness what assurance in my soul. On the stormy sea, he speaks peace to me. And the billows cease to roll. Would you sing this with me? Joys are flowing like a river. Since the comfort has come he
Close your eyes. Lift your hands to the Lord. Surrender to his touch now. Surrender. 
surrender to the movings of the Holy Spirit. Let him come upon you. Let the Spirit set you at liberty, set you free. If you need to repent, then repent before the Lord right now. Repent of your sin. Oh, call upon his name. Oh, for he is worthy to be praised. Call upon the Lord. And the Bible says, he will answer you. And I'll call upon the name of the Lord. I'll call your name. Your name is Jesus. Your name is Savior. Oh, wonderful counselor, prince of peace. Hallelujah. There's nothing that can compare to the presence of God. There's no greater peace. There's no more significant source of strength. There's nothing that compares to the joy that we find in the presence of God. For again, His presence is fullness of joy and peace everlasting. In His presence, the dead becomes alive. The lost become found. The blind see the mute speak and the deaf hear. Yes, hallelujah. It's in His presence that yokes are destroyed and burdens are lifted. Hallelujah. It's in His presence that relationships are restored. Right. It's in His presence that there's healing for our bodies, our hearts, our minds. Yes. Amen. There's hope for the weary. And there's restoration for the broken. The Bible declares that let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And it is His redeemed that are invited to enter into His presence. So I will declare that as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord because I walk in His presence. And not only is His presence around us, it's among us, but most importantly, it is within us. 
and I'm thankful for his presence that I get to feel and sense. That even when I lack understanding and I lack the sensation, the feeling, by faith I know that God goes before me. And he's calling me with a call that I have to answer. Let's give the Lord a hand clap as we close. (laughs) Hallelujah. You can be seated if you can. God is good. Amen. God is good. Amen. It's time. It's high time. It's time to enter into his presence. Can you say amen? Amen. It's like, well, it's great when we're all together. It is fantastic when we have a corporate anointing and we get to sense his presence as a body together. But let me say this. It it's, can be just as powerful, if not more powerful, when you feel his presence on your own as you're meeting with God face to face, one on one. Amen. And it's like, how do I get to that place? Well, you set the atmosphere. You change, uh, you put some praise on. You turn off your phone. You disconnect from the distractions. You get the dishes done so they're not the ones. I've noticed this. Dishes, uh, dishes really call out to be done when God's ready to start speaking to you. And uh, there's no other time that I feel motivated to do dishes than when I'm about ready to sit down and spend some time with the Lord. Amen. And his presence is here with us. Amen. And I'm, I'm, it's, I'm in awe of the glory of God that rests upon his people. Hallelujah. Go ahead and prepare in your morning tithes and offerings. We're going to continue in our worship and praise as we give unto the Lord. Now, the Bible says that we're to give him, our, give him our first and our best. Bring the whole tithe into the house according to Malachi chapter 4. And uh, we don't bring that out of a, we don't use that scripture out of compulsion, but we do it out of, so that we're informed and we're obedient to God's word. Can you say amen? amen? And in the trying times that we're living in, how many of you guys are aware that we're in trying times? Amen. amen. There's, there's more month now than there is money. Can you say amen? amen. There's, uh, uh, I know in our own family budget, our grocery budget's gone up at least 25%. And they're like, well, but, but collective inflation is only this. Well, I don't care about collective inflation. I care about the inflation that affects me on a regular basis. And if milk and eggs and bread and vegetables and all that stuff go up, it affects me. I don't care if they drop the prices on the stuff I don't eat. I want it to go down on the stuff I do eat. Amen. But I know this, that God is faithful to preserve and protect his people. That even in the days of Moses, as uh, the children of Israel suffered under a tyrannical government, a king who thought he knew best for the people, God heard the cry of his people and sent a deliverer. Can you say amen? You're like, well, who's our deliverer going to be? When do we get to write his or her name on the ballot? Let me say this, your deliverer is already here and he's already come. Amen. So let's participate in God's, in God's, uh, God's kingdom principles through the act of giving, through the act of tithing, that we give cheerfully, we give generously, we give obediently unto the Lord. Can you say amen? And I'll say this, after, uh, for, for decades, my wife and I, uh, before we got married and after we, since we've been married, um, have practiced uh, being generous with our time, our energy, our, our finances. And God has always returned to us, and he's blessed us. And you go, well, what about the hot water heater that went out last week? <sighs> it's repaired. <laughs> I, I grew up around men that showed me how to do stuff so I could do it on my own. And that saved me about $1,000 there. And, and it's like, how I, well, I got 13 years out of my hot water heater. That's about 40% longer than the average person here in Hutchinson, Kansas. So I'll take that as a blessing. Amen? Because Amen? God will rebuke the devourer, but we know this, that entropy still occurs here on this earth. Moth and rust consume. Things wear out. Amen? But I believe this, when God sets a seal upon his people, that God preserves his people in calamitous times. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Let's pray. We love you. We honor you, God. We honor you with not only our song, Lord God, but we honor you with our giving. Lord God, we thank you that as we give, we give in faith, Lord God, that you return 30, 60, 100 fold, Lord God. Lord God, you said in your word that we're to cast our bread upon the water and in not many days it'll return to us. Lord God, I thank you uh, that there's an inheritance for being a part of your family. Lord, uh, for those that are in lack and those that are in need, Lord God, I thank you that you make up the difference, Lord God, that, that a little bit of obedience, a little bit of faith goes a long way. Show yourself strong on behalf of your people, Lord God, as they honor you, Lord God, I thank you that you honor them uh, with uh, blessings that are poured out 
uh, from the windows of heaven. We glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Go ahead and pass the baskets. Ushers, a couple things. Tonight, everybody say tonight. Tonight we have men's and women's meetings. Show up. Can you say amen? Um, young men, show up. We've had uh, these last few months, we've had some sparsely populated men's groups. And uh, there's seats ready for you. So come, show up. You're like, but I don't know anybody. Well, what better way to get to know somebody than by hanging around them? Can you say amen? Um, young men, show up too. Amen. There's a word for you. Can you say amen? That there's things, there's things that are uh, coming up in your future that you need to have some wisdom and input from some godly men who have made some mistakes. How many of, how many of the guys that have attended our men's group have made some big mistakes? Boom. <laughs> Me. I'll lift up both hands on that one. And uh, maybe, maybe a little bit of wisdom will help you help avert some of those mistakes. How many of you guys, uh, let moms, dads, grandmas, grandpas, if we could distill the mistakes that we had in our life and get it down to the very, uh, uh, just the simplest of terms, and we could like put it into a serum and inject it into our kids so they don't repeat the mistakes of our past, how many of you guys would be down for that? Like totally circumvent avert, like, don't, don't date bozos, girls. Can you say amen? amen? But he's hot. Well, so is hell. So let's not compare, let's not use that. Uh, I mean, uh, anyways, we'll get into some of that in the word. I mean, but, but some of these, some, sometimes we're looking in the mirror and go, man, I wish I would have, I really would have, it really would have been a good idea for, my, for me not to take out a credit card at 19 years old at 29.99% interest. Right? Because uh, um, it hurts. And then all of a sudden you see your kid bop in and go, they said I'm pre-qualified. Well, I say you're disqualified in Jesus' name. Go get you a job and pay with cash. Um, but we'd like to distill that and put that in. And, and there's nuggets in our men's and women's meetings so that we become better dads. Better, those of you women will be better wives, um, better families. Uh, better workers, can you say amen? You never know who you're going to make a connection to and that blessing that'll be later on. Uh, coming up, uh, mark your calendars. We'll have, we'll have a sign-up sheet next week, but uh, October 15th, I think it's a Sunday. We're going to have Pastor Appreciation Day uh, that day and appreciate our pastors here at Victorious Life Church. We have good pastors here, um, not just because I'm one of them, but uh, the, my closest friends too, and they're great men and women of God. So we're going to have a dinner right after church, no service that night. Um, then we have Hallelujah Party coming up uh, October 29th at 4.30 p.m. Again, we'll have a sign-up sheet. Participate. Youth, get involved. Come early. Help set up. Stay late. Help clean up. And uh, we're, we're going to have a good time in the Lord that night. And then last one, um, it didn't make it in October's bulletin, but uh, the first Sunday of November, I think it is November 6th, if I'm correct. 5th. November 5th, thank you, Sister Diana. Uh, Joy Burchette will be ministering both in the morning and afternoon or evening service. Uh, she's, uh, I believe she's just turned 92 years old. And uh, we're excited to have her here. And if it's, if it's been a long time since you had a good hug from a mom, get a hug from her because she hugs you like a mom, like a grandma. And uh, not only just... Uh, uh, ministering of through uh, showing good godly affection but she's got a good word and uh, it'll build you up can you say amen, amen. kiddos we're let's release the kids kiddos come on up young men young ladies any of the young ladies here come on up noah here we go got some young champions you guys ready to go back and play learn about jesus be be good friends all right get your lights up Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles, turn over to 1 John chapter 3. We're going to start in 1 John chapter 3. Last week we had a, a sermon on where do we come from? Where do we come from? How do you guys remember that? Yeah. Seven days ago, where do we come from? Uh, there's three questions we're going to answer over the, these three weeks. Last week we answered where do we come from, that we're created in the image and likeness of God, that God put us here. Can you say amen? amen. It's not today, not tonight, this morning. We're going to answer the second question, is why am I here? Why am I here? 
Not only is it important to understand where we come from, but it's also important to figure out why we're here. Yeah. What's our purpose in this life? And next week, um, God willing, we'll uh, talk about what happens to us when we die. That's an important question. Yes. Amen? And here's the thing. You need to get that question right. Yeah. Right? Um, so uh, this morning, why am I here? So we're talking about purpose. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We honor you. We give you praise. We give you glory. We thank you. Uh, for all your goodness, your blessings, Lord God, we thank you that we are created in your likeness, your image, Lord God, and you've set your seal upon us as we've given our heart to you, Jesus. Uh, Lord, we thank you that we're uh, filled with the Holy Spirit. We have purpose in our lives, Lord God, and we fulfill the mission that you have for us. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. and amen. Things have purpose. Can you say amen? Yeah. The chair that you're sitting in has a purpose. We use the right tools for the right jobs. Uh, as I grew up, I was, grew up the son of a self-employed uh, subcontract roofer. And uh, a nail gun that's used to nail on shingles is really good at nailing on shingles. It's not, very, it's not a very good hammer. It's like a $500 hammer in your hand. You shouldn't use a nail gun to beat in nails. Although the guys that have worked with me, you have occasionally seen it. Well, I buy it so I can do what I want to do with it. That's my tool. But you use the proper tool for the proper job. A, a screwdriver is a fantastic tool for doing what it's designed for, but it's really terrible at other things. Uh, the chairs that we sit in, they have a purpose. They're really good at helping us be comfortable. And thank you, Jesus, for padded chairs that we've had for a couple decades. Because when I started coming to Victorious Life Church, when we were at the small building on 26th and Washington, we had hard oak pews. And a lot of people br brought blankets. Not because it was cold, like it gets cold in here. But you, put, you brought in a blanket so you'd have a little bit of extra cushion for the cushion. And uh, it'd, wear, it'd, wear, it'd wear you down. And I was young at that time, so I could endure probably not so much today. Um, we're thankful for chairs. The, the chairs aren't really good step stools, although they'll do the job sometimes. And things have purpose. The, the floor that we're standing on has a purpose. It has a purpose to help keep the building up. To have us a smooth, the walls are constructed with the purpose. The girders that are hidden behind the ceiling, they have a purpose. Everything that we see in life has a purpose. And here's the thing, if everything that we see and plan out in life has a purpose, does it not mean that God has a purpose for our lives as well? That if we're created in the image of, that since we're created in the image and likeness of God, we're not created for no end. As we look at the first six, day, at the six days of creation, every time God created something, it had a purpose. And the culmination of creation on day six was you and I. Not only does God give us a purpose, but God sent Jesus with a purpose. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8, he says, He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the evil one. Jesus did not come to hand out muffins and rainbows and give us pithy little sayings that fit really nice on posters and coffee cups. Can you say amen? amen. Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost and destroy the works of the devil. Jesus did not come to teach us how to be more tolerant. Can you say amen? amen. Jesus did not come to teach us to be, how to be more accepting. Jesus came as the expressed image of God to show us the way that we should have walked from the very beginning. And, and John, one of Jesus' closest disciples, John the Beloved, who had followed Jesus from a very young age, writing at the end of his life, uh, reminds the church of the purpose that Jesus came. Jesus came for this purpose. The Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. So what's the ministry of Jesus in my own life? It's still a continuation of his ministry because the ministry of Jesus never stops and it doesn't change. It is to destroy the works of the devil in my own life. The ministry of Jesus in my family is to destroy the works of the devil in my family's life. Destroy the works of the devil where I'm employed and people have to cooperate and get along with the work of Jesus in our lives. And the work of Jesus is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Because the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead 
will also make alive our mortal bodies. Luke chapter 19 and verse 10 says this, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. The first that Jesus came to seek and save was the lost house of the children of Israel. Can you say amen? His ministry was first to his people, to the Jews, and they rejected him. You know, Jesus did not fit their idea of what their Messiah should be. He did not come riding on a white charger in his, in his first advent. He did not come bearing the sword ready to kick the Romans out. Instead, he gave us words like, no greater love is in this than a man lay his life down for his friends. Moses said this in the law, but this is what I tell you. He came as a lawgiver and a law restorer. He came to the lost house of the children of Israel. And when he looked upon Jerusalem right before he's ready to go t through his passion, he looks on Jerusalem with compassion and said, Jerusalem, O oh Jerusalem, how I would have liked to gather you like hens, like little chicks under my wings. Jesus didn't fit. Jesus did not ride on the white horse, but he will come on a white horse. See, the people of Jesus' day, they thought Jesus was coming. His first advent was to be coming as lion. But before he could become lion, he had to come as lamb, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, got it 100% right when he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world that he must increase and we must decrease, make straight his paths. And even though Jesus came as a lamb in his first advent, he's returning as the lion of the tribe of Judah, writing according to Revelation chapter 17. Right, 17, Pastor Jim? According to Revelation chapter 17, he's going to be riding on that white horse. 19, I get 17 and 19 mixed up all the time. Revelation chapter 19, where Jesus... Uh, the, uh, Jesus uh, is, is showing up and John, the same John that wrote the book of 1 John gives us the depiction of Jesus riding on a white horse, wearing a white robe his hair is white, there's flame of fire in his eyes there's a sword coming out of his mouth there's a rod of iron in his hand there's a, a name tattooed on his leg, king of kings lord of lords, he's not just wearing a white robe but it's a white robe dipped in blood now, if you're getting ready to throw down with somebody and somebody shows up, let's say you're going into the octagon and you got you know, one guy in his little Speedo shorts <laughs> that they wear when they're fighting and he's in there ready to go. And the other guy that's coming to the, to the, through the arena, coming to the ring to fight you is wearing a robe that's dipped in blood. You're losing the fight. <laughs> he's choking you out. You're going to tap. Like there's no, there, you're not winning that fight. Not only is Jesus coming like that, but he's got an entire army of his people riding with him. Jesus is lamb. Jesus is lion. Jesus com comes with the purpose. Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. We got a lot of scripture to cover today. Hallelujah. Acts 10 and 38 says this, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. God sends Jesus with a purpose. God created us with a purpose, for a purpose. When we understand the how and the what, we can start to answer the question, why? Why am I here? See, purpose sets our course. Can you say amen? purpose sets our course. Just like a good dad who's preparing uh, for vacation, we go, uh, we log into our phone, onto Google Maps, and we find the end location, end, the end location, where we're going to be. And if we're traveling to Colorado Springs, it, the average person, it'll take right around six hours to get to. I try to do it in five hours and 30 minutes if I can. The, the driving time is just a mere suggestion. It's the goal is to beat your driving time. It just is. It just is like, hey, they give you 10 miles an hour. No sense in taking 14 if you can get away. Anyway, sorry, shouldn't say that. 
there's a lot of speed traps on I-70. And uh, it's always quicker going out than coming back. Uh, but but you're, you're, it sets your course. Uh, when, when you set a course, you not only know where you're going, but you know where you're starting from. And when you understand your purpose, you not only identify where you're going, but you evaluate where you're starting from. In that, it helps us identify our priorities or what's important in my life. What's important? When you understand your purpose, you know what's important in your life. You find out that climbing to the top of the corporate ladder is a very lonely place. Because I've hung out with the men and women who have excelled greatly, sacrificed their families, times with, times with friends, that they thought co-workers were friends. But actually they were hanger-ons that were only around so they could get something from the other person. And they climb to the top of the ladder and they find it's extremely lonely, isolating. And a lot of them are disappointed that they spent that much time to get there. They thought their purpose was to build a company when their true purpose was to bless somebody else. Purpose identifies our priorities. Also, purpose helps eliminate fluff. It gets rid of the distractions in our lives. As Jesus' soon return is imminent, we don't have time to mess around. It's time to get in the ark of Jesus. Amen. Young people, you do not have time. Don't take 30 years to start to figure things out. For the 15, 16, 17-year-olds, do not, do not waste away your 20s as you're trying to figure out this life. And wait till you've encountered a bankruptcy, have an unwanted child, and a failed relationship before you get your heart back right with the Lord. You may not have that time to play around. It eliminates the distractions in life. Like, why do you bring that up? Because I've seen it time and time and time again. And I'm thankful for God's restoration and redeeming power that prodigals do come back and there's a place for them in his house. And if you've been a prodigal and you've come back to the Lord after experience a time of waywardness, be thankful every day for God's grace upon your life. And don't look down critically at other people who need to come back to the Lord as well. And those that have always served the Lord, don't look down critically at those who need to come back to the Lord either. Welcome them with open arms just as the Father does. Well, let me say this. The prodigal isn't the best example to live by in the New Testament. It's best to stay found in the house than to be lost and found. It eliminates the fluff, the things that just don't add anything to life. Priority or purpose also provides focus. Where am I headed? What am I doing? I'm on a, I'm on a mission from God today. I have a mandate from heaven. I have a vision that has to be fulfilled. I got purpose in my bones. There's a, I'm not doing this, these things to no end, but I'm out here trying to accomplish what God has called me to do by his grace, by the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Our nation, our culture, we're facing an epidemic. We think the biggest epidemic, pandemic that we experienced in this world over the last four years was a virus. It is not. I believe one of the greatest epidemics that has been affecting our generation is purpose, purposelessness. People living life without a purpose, living below their potential, eating scraps when they should be eating at the table. What do you mean by that? My kiddos, my kiddos show up to the house, unless it's left overnight, which we have left overnight like three nights a week, because when we make food, we make a lot of food. Just saying. I got two, two kiddos living in our house. My daughter, who's 14, and the baby she is carrying is not her baby. <laughs> let's, go, let's get on the record. That baby carrier, she is, it is a fake baby. It is a pre-programmed baby. It is teaching her that she is not ready to have babies, which I am all for. Right? All for. Just saying. Ah. So I got a 14-year-old daughter in my house, an 11-year-old son. I got a 22-year-old that's moved out of the house. Would, it be, would I be a good dad if I'm cooking up 
a bunch of chicken fried steak with mashed potatoes and gravy. Corn, salt and pepper, right? Right, would I, like sat Friday night, Saturday night cooking at the Dilbeck household, we're gonna throw down some chicken fried steak. <sighs> we're, we're ma- I'm got the whole, like when I do chicken fried steak, it takes me a good two hours to get it done because it's a lot of work and everybody enjoys it, but no one enjoys cleaning it up. <laughs> it's a mess to clean up, but it is good while it's good eating. Would it be okay if I made this giant spread? For my kids and my wife, the two kids that live in my home, and then when my oldest son comes over and go, let's get you a bologna sandwich. (laughs) I'll even let you have mustard this time. (laughs) But don't use the fresh bread, use the old, old bread, because we need to get that used up before we use up the other bread. I'd be a bad dad. He'd also be a bad son. If he came in and his father and mother prepared a nice spread and he walked in and opened up the refrigerator and said, you know what, I don't deserve the good food. Where's the really old stuff? Where's the seven-day-old hamburger helper? Because that's all I deserve. If one of your kids came into your house and you've prepared a a spread, prepared a blessing for them, and they walked in and they said, I don't deserve the good stuff. I deserve the least. Give me that freezer burnt stuff. (laughs) We'll just scrape that part off. As a mom or a dad, you'd be offended that your son or your daughter would even think like that about themselves. You'd correct him immediately. You go, you're way more deserving than that. There's a spot for you at the table. Come and sit. In fact, I will get your plate for you. You don't have to take the little portion, but I'm going to give you more than enough because I want you to know the love of a father, the love of a mother, and that you've been invited here and you're not second class because you're just coming across the threshold, but you were rated as first class because you're my child. And God invites us to his table. And we shouldn't be settling for scraps when we sit at his table. When we're going through life without purpose, sometimes we're settling for scraps instead of engaging in what God has called us to do. Does that make any sense? As a nation, we're facing uh, whatever you want to call it of so many people without purpose. At the height of the COVID pandemic, alcohol abuse, tobacco use, illicit drugs spike. Depression and anxiety were at all-time cultural highs. Just the cost of addiction in our country cost over $740 billion. And probably if it got recalculated over these last few years with the state of our nation, it's probably pushing near or over a trillion dollars a year. And many of that are people who found purpose in something else rather than how God designed them and what God designed them for. There's a pit of purposelessness, if I could say that right. In addition to drugs and alcohol, people are isolated and they lack friends. What's a true friend? I believe this, everybody needs to have two or three ride-by-your-side friends. This is how I define a friend, not someone who's nice to you. Right? Not someone who's nice to you. Because there's going to be people that are nice to you, but they're only nice to you as long as you give them something in return. A friend is someone who wants the very best for you. He wants the best for you. There's, there's a lot of people in my life that I call friends, but there's like I'm talking about that core group of friends who want the very best for you. A friend is someone who can share bad news with. Sometimes we experience bad news in our life. 
And a friend isn't one that you share bad news with, and we've all been there before, and we need to avoid it if we're going to be a good friend to somebody else. Is when somebody else tells us their burden or shares us their problem, sometimes our inclination is to barely listen to what they're having to say. And they go, you think that's tough? Well, let me tell you what I've been through. And then all of a sudden, we're unloading ourselves as somebody's trying to pour out their heart to us. Someone you can share bad news with. It's not going to make excuses, but it's going to give a perspective of, you know what, it, it, it may seem like your world is falling apart, but really it's falling into place. Yes, and you've been through tough times before, and you're going to endure tough times, and you're going to get through this and, and give you a word that builds you up rather than be, beat you down. Amen. A friend who wants the best for you yes. that you can share bad news with. But there's also, sometimes you got to be careful and you got to also find that friend that not only wants the best for you, that you can share bad news with, but also someone that you can share good news to. Yes, amen. Yes, amen, amen, amen. Share good news too. You get blessed and you got a new car, you want to show it off. It's super clean. It's like dealership lot clean. And if it's like in our family, it's going to be like that for five days. <laughs> My car. That's her car when I, after I clean it. But, but, but it's like it's not going to be like that. And you're showing it off and, and you're posting your pictures on, on your social media and you're excited. We all get excited about our new things or a new guitar or a new gun. If you're a guy, you can never have too many guitars or guns. I'm just saying. That's in the Word of God. That's in the Word. Somewhere. <laughs> Somewhere. We'll find it. We'll find it. Um, but it's not true, but it'd be nice if it was. Um, hallelujah. He prepares our hands for war. Anyway, so you got to have stuff to fight with. And uh, he talks about praising God with the stringed instruments. He didn't say how many you needed. You have to have a variety of them. So there you go. Um, where was where going with that? Hallelujah. You want to have someone in your life that you can share good news with without them getting jealous or them going, you don't really deserve that. Or that friend that didn't get received that same blessing, they should be rejoicing with you. But sometimes that bad friend is the one that goes, oh, it's good for you, but what about me? Mm-hmm. Nobody's given me a car before. Nobody's given me a refrigerator. Nobody's blessed me like this. Nobody's just randomly given me cash before. <laughs> Maybe it's the position of your heart and the attitude of your mind that cuts off the blessing. And maybe if you were blessed like that, you wouldn't appreciate it. But we're experiencing uh, unprecedented isolation. People have few intimate and close relationships. Sometimes they're for a reason because you had close and intimate relationships with people that took advantage of you. It's hard to trust again. It takes a lifetime to build trust, but it only takes one moment to have it broken. Joblessness. It's a tough one. Like, but, but the economic indicators show that unemployment's gone down at an unprecedented rate over these last few years. <sighs> um, let me just say this. I'm a statistics guy. I know how to do statistics. My statistics professor told me this on the very first day. There are lies, and there are bad lies, and then there are statistics. Um, what they don't tell you is they talk about joblessness is that after so long as someone not being unemployed they just stop counting people so if you haven't had a job I think it used to be 24 months if you hadn't had a job for 24 months and you're of working age they just quit counting you so all of a sudden the numbers change and they say oh it's the numbers gone down from 9.7 to 5.6 what they don't tell you is that they changed the cutoff from 24 months to 18 months and all of a sudden, you just stop counting a bunch of people. And then all of a sudden, you adjust the age, and you adjust the requirement, and then you adjust the criterion for, for how you're selecting. It's like, well, these are people that are seeking jobs, and we're going to not count all the people that aren't seeking jobs. And then we're not going to count, then also we're only going to count anybody that's worked any minute of any time during the week, and we're not going to count the people that are underemployed. 
And then you get this magic new number and you get talking heads saying, look at the progress we've made. <laughs> um, talk to the people that are underhoused or homeless. Find out their opportunity. Also talk to the hiring managers of various places. It becomes a pit where people lack purpose. On top of that, sometimes there's just simply health challenges that hold us down. And any three of those happening simultaneously in a per person's life will steal your purpose and cause it to be very, very difficult to get out of bed in the morning. That's why we have to keep our eyes on our purpose that's greater than our singular circumstances that are around us. Hallelujah. Let's look at, uh, let's look at Psalm chapter 40 and verse 1. And as you do, I'm reminded of what we talked about last week. That because of the fall of Adam and Eve and all mankind, we right now are living lower than God's purpose and intent for our lives. We are created, if you're taking notes, write this down, to walk with God. We're created to walk with God. Number two, we're created to talk to God. Number three, we're created to work for God. And number four, we're created to worship God. Hold your finger in Psalm chapter 40. I will get to that in the second point. But let's look at Genesis chapter 5 and verse 21. The Bible writes, as you, as you start to read past the first three chapters of Genesis, get into chapter 4, you have the fall of Cain and Abel. By chapter 5, you get into some of the genealogies of, the, of those who lived on the earth pre-flood. And as you're going through your year in a Bible study or whatever you, whatever you use to read through your word, you'll get to chapter 5 and you'll just start reading these names really, really quick. They're, they have a lot of syllables and a lot of us at the end of their name. And we really don't take consideration as we're reading through them. They're just nameless, faceless people that God recorded. And if you read it too quick, you'll miss a guy and his name is Enoch. Genesis chapter 5 and verse 21 says this, Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. So he's having his son Methuselah at the age of 65. I'm not ready for another kid at the age of 44. Yet alone getting another one at 65, that ain't happening. After he got Methuselah, Enoch, underline this, walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Enoch became the first was not. It is much better to become a was not than a has been. Enoch walked with God. We know this from the accounts in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 3 especially Genesis chapter 3, that as God called out Adam and Eve after their fall, uh, they, they account that God was walking in the garden, implying that God walked with his people each and every day. And Enoch tapped into something that we don't see in the other generations. We don't see many righteous in these generations except for Adam till he fall. We see Abel, who offered a more excellent sacrifice, we get to Enoch, who walked with God, and we really don't see anybody really cool until we get to Noah. But Enoch landed on something before there were preachers, before there were podcasts, before there were a thousand self-help books, before there were outlines and devotionals, and Enoch got the revelation of, you know what? My, my forefather, Adam, he walked with God, and it, it wasn't perfect, but, but as he walked with God, God... Um, it got easier for Adam. So maybe, what if I walk with God? So Enoch, after he's had his kid at 65, decides he's going to walk with God. When's the best day to start walking with God? Today's the best day to start walking with God. Like, but I've been walking from him. 
Well, instead of walking from him, you're like, well, I got to walk to him. No, walk with him. That's good. That's good. Walk with him. He's not holding you far off. Right. Walk with him. Enoch walked with God. He got so close to God that he was not. It's, it's implied through the story of Enoch and the preaching and teaching on Enoch that Enoch started to see the end from the beginning. And Enoch got such a deep revelation of who God was that God's like, hey, I'm not ready to reveal this. I got to take you out. Enoch was the first one that was raptured, taken out of his time and space. And Enoch becomes a type and a shadow for the church of the people who walk with God, that God preserves and protects in their generations. And he's called us to walk with him. Like, how do I walk with him? Well, how do you walk with anybody? You just move. You walk with them. You walk with them. You walk with them. It's not that hard to do. We make it way more complicated to walk with God than what it is. You just start walking with him. And sometimes there are going to be times where he's far ahead and you might have to catch up a little bit. There's going to be other times where we get too far ahead and he needs to slow us down some. But you start to walk with him. You walk with him, and if you walk with him, you're going to talk to him. In Genesis 3 and 8, it was recorded this, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. There are those that have given there are those that have given their hearts to Jesus and they're still hiding from the Lord. And he's calling you forth. He's calling you out. Not calling you out to embarrass you, but calling you out so you can start to walk with him again. You're trying to cover. See, when we're worshiping God, as we did corporately this morning, there are those that get, like, you're excited about the presence of God. Like, like I've been waiting for this moment all week long to sing songs to the Lord, to play instruments, to, to, to do what God's created me to do. And we'll close with talking about worship. But it's the presence of God. Like, I'm excited about the presence of God. But there are also others that show up, and they're like, and when the presence of God shows up, woe is me, for I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live in a generation of unclean lips. Sometimes people are trying to run and hide from the presence of God. The psalmist declares this, that we cannot hide from his presence at all. Even if we made our bed in hell, we can't escape the presence of God. We walk with God, and it gives us purpose. As we walk with God, that means we follow Jesus. Over and over again through the, throughout the Gospels, Jesus simply says this, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. That's Matthew chapter 4 and verse 19. Let's look at Luke 9 and verse 23. Luke 9, 23. And he said to them all, everybody say all. all. Say that means, me. that means me. And he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Jesus is on the move. 24. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the Son of Man, will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory, and in his Father's, and of the holy angels. If anyone desires to follow after Jesus, you have to take up your cross. Another part of the gospel says take it up daily. Deny yourself. 
follow him. Follow him. Like, but I can't do that. None of us can. That's why God gives us his grace. To do for us what we can't do for ourselves. But I've made mistakes, haven't we all? But I'm not ready yet. So when do you think you are going to get ready? Next week? Next month? Next year? You've been saying for years that you're going to get ready. Now is the time for salvation. Because the next time you're going to think about getting ready is when a trumpet sounds. And instead of saying... Instead of saying, I'm, I'm going to get ready, it's, I wish we'd all been ready. Well, I'll get my marriage in order when we're ready. Get it in order today. Go eat lunch. Don't share harsh words with each other. If one goes in to take a nap, the other one crawl into bed at the same time. But the grass needs mowed and the dishes need done. Well, maybe spending some time together will prevent grass being mo- needed, needing to be mowed in two separate houses and dishes being done in two separate sinks. Now's the time to get ready. Is this okay to preach like this? Yeah. Amen. <sighs> There's purpose, church. And, you're sitting, and some are, we're sitting here going, well, that's not me. Let me say this, you're encountering a half a dozen people that need to hear something similar on a weekly basis. Maybe this is a word that you receive as a seed so it multiplies and just blesses somebody else. A young CNA pops their head into the office, says my life is a mess. Well, I just heard this sermon on purpose. And this is what the pastor said. There's a guy who's struggling to do this at the office or this on the job site. Let me just remind you that God's created us for a purpose. We follow him, we take up a cross, we follow him. If you scroll scroll down. (sighs) Scroll down further in your Bible. If you continue to read on Luke chapter 9 and get to verse 57... It says, now it happened as they journeyed on the road. That means they were rolling together. They journeyed together. To him, hallelujah, let me get, now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have deaths, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And then he said to another, follow me. And he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And the Lord said to him, let the dead bury the dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid farewell, or bid them farewell who are at my house. And the Lord said, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. When you know your true purpose, everything comes is put in order. Is Jesus saying that we neglect our parents as they're aging? Absolutely not. Is Jesus saying that we should be rude to our friends? No, not in any way, shape, or form, but Jesus is reminding us that he's the number one priority, that he's the center of it all. That some things are just going to have to take care of themselves while we take care of God's business. And once you start following, don't look back. Don't look back. If you look back, you'll be like Lot's wife. You'll look back with fondness in her hearts. She looked back at Sodom and Gomorrah, depraved depraved cities with cultures that would be similar to San Jose and San Francisco. And it wasn't like she was looking back to go, oh, that's the Golden Gate Bridge or the Fisherman's Wharf or or I had such great food in that location, she looked back at the debauchery of those cities and she looked back with fondness in her heart 
and she was turned to a pillar of salt, stuck forever. We don't look back. So we walk with Jesus. Next one, we talk to Jesus. Now we want to get to Psalm 40. Psalm chapter 40 says this in verse 1. It says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me, and he heard my cry. He heard my cry. He brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. He put a new song in my mouth, praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined and he heard my cry. Not only do we walk with Jesus, but we talk to Jesus. As you read through the Psalms, so there are certain Psalms that get us super excited. But let me just say this, by number, two-thirds of the Psalms recorded are laments to God. They're cries out to God. And sometimes we feel as we're coming into the presence of God that we got to be the tower of power and have the right words to say at the right time. And we're obscuring the condition of our heart with flowery words. Let me just say this, any time that I've come into the presence of God and I've tried to use the thouest and beest thou greatest, O God, of heaven and earth, who sits upon your throne in high, I, I thee, your child, petition you lowly of heart and meekness of soul, that you would grant thy servant mercy and grace in my despair. <laughs> and we think if we, we come to God like that, that he's going to get like, oh, they're using the right language. <sighs> because we're obscuring the condition of our heart by using flowery words. When really what it needs to be is, God, I messed up! <laughs> I don't know. I know how I got myself in. I don't know how I'm getting myself out. Like I'm the biggest enemy of my own heart. God, deliver me from me. Lord, and not only am, am I against myself, but I got other people that are against me. And they're talking smack, and they're talking junk, and they're spreading lies, and I'm believing their lies over their truth. Help me, God. Help me, help me to know who I am. God, you're my God, and early will I seek you. And it starts out as a lament and a cry to God, a, a distressed beacon of the soul. And God inclines to us, and he hears a cry. I know this about being a father. I know the cries of my kids. I've heard a lot of them in this place. They've cried out. As a mother and father, you know when your kid's crying. And you know the cry when they're just whining. <sighs> Stop it. Most of the time. <sighs> you, know, you know when they're disappointed. You know when somebody hurt their feelings. And you also know when they're hurt. And you know the cry of your kid. <laughs> I remember preaching up here. I could hear the cries of my kids from the back. <laughs> so could everybody else. <laughs> There are other times where I hear the cry of a kid in the back and I go, that's not mine this time. That's awesome. Great. Somebody else gets embarrassed in the service besides me. Um, but you hear the cry of your kid and you go and you tend to them. God hears the cry of his people. Jesus reminds us of this in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9. As we talk to God. In this manner, therefore, pray. He gives us an outline, a model for prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory 
forever. Amen. A model for prayer. Now, when you pray, Jesus says, Jesus anticipated and expected his followers to pray to God. Though we come before God and we call him Father, it's bowing our hearts in respect to him, our Father in heaven, reminding ourselves of where he's seated, seated above, far above principalities and powers, rulers of darkness of this age, and that we're seated in heavenly places with him. Though we hallow his name, God, your name is holy. While the world is using your name in vain, God, your name is holy. And I want your name to be holy on my lips. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. God's kingdom is in us, around us, among us. We heard kingdom preaching this midsummer. And his kingdom is coming. But most importantly, he wants to see his kingdom made manifest in his children while we're walking on this earth. Your will be done. As I'm praying for our government and leaders and various things that I have concern in my heart, I'm praying, God, your will be done. For those that want to mutilate children, they'll get their just due. God's will will be done. Those that are hurting kids, abusing kids, neglecting kids, God, your will be done. Like, that's a dangerous prayer to pray. And his will will be done. Because the deeds of the evil, the psalmist writes, will be like the grass. And it will be consumed by fire. Those that are taking from the haves to give them to the have-nots. Just because you call it taxation, it does not mean it is not stealing. There are certain things that affect a dad's heart. As you see housing prices go up 25, 30%, and you wonder how your own kids will ever be able to afford a house of their own. God, not my will, but your will be done. On earth, most importantly, not only in the earth that we stand our feet on, but in this earth. God, your will be done in this earth, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, God's provision for his people. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. I love the forgiveness of God. I need it on a daily basis. I need it. I got attitudes, actions, reactions, motivations, challenges that come out sometimes from nowhere. And most of the time they're right out in front of me. That person who cut, cut you off. The checkout person that acted like they didn't know what their job was. Well, let me tell you how to do your job. This is how you do your job. What they don't say is like, I've only been here for three days and I've got like 15 minutes of training and I'm doing my very, very best and I got three screaming kids that are hungry at home and I'm trying to get through this moment in my day so I can get back to take care of them and because I can't scan your groceries at the pace that you would like, that is not my problem today. I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but it's happened to me. <laughs> and then I feel really, really small as I sit in my car. Hallelujah. I won't tell that story, but it is a good one. <sighs> forgive us our debts. I love the forgiveness of God when it's poured out in my life. And that same forgiveness we need to extend to other people as well, yeah. those that have offended us. Does that mean because I've, I've forgiven somebody that I need to start walking with them and our relationship needs to be hunky-dory and all that stuff? Absolutely not. Because there's sometimes there's toxic relationships and there are people in our lives that bring out the worst in us and don't bring out the best in us. And time is too short. I do not have room in my bag to hang out with people who bring out the worst in me. I don't. People that have, have called me a liar and, and condemned this and said this and talked smack on this. Like, God, I forgive them. God, hold no charge against them. But I'm not eating lunch with them. I'm not rolling with them. Can you say amen? Well, what if they showed back up to the church? I'd shake their hand and go, I think maybe you should go somewhere else. But that's mean. No, it's a preservation. It's being a pastor. 
It's going, I'm not going to let certain things infect and affect other people that I love. And I can forgive somebody, but that doesn't mean I need to sit down and eat lunch with them. That's truth. And forgiveness does not mean I have to have a, I can love them with the love of the Lord and I can love them from a distance. Because there's people in my life that I need to love up close. And sometimes people have violated someone to such a degree that there's no more room in my end for them. And I pray that there be room in somebody else's place for them. But before they connect with someone else, they need to get their heart right. They need to get their head right. They need to deal with their issues and quit repeating certain things over and over and over again. So just because we forgive does not mean we need to invite somebody back to our table over and over and over again. If he raised his hand in anger against you, there is no more room for that. If people have violated vows, there's not room for that. Can you say amen? What about the healing and rest? God does miracles. And it's because two people are willing to cooperate and roll with Jesus. Can you say amen? But if there's one person that's not cooperative, you can forgive. You can believe uh, that God makes things right. But that doesn't mean you have to invite him back in. Hallelujah. Is this okay? I'm probably going to say this a bunch this morning. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Let's look at Psalm uh, 61. We actually sang that this morning, I believe. Actually, it's not this one that we sang. It was another one that we sang. I got 34 in my notes. We'll get 34 here after a little bit. Psalm 34, talk with God. Hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth I will cry to you when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. Hear my cry, O God, and attend to my prayer. We're created to walk with God, to talk to God. We're created to worship. Can, can you say amen? Actually, before we get to created to worship, we're created to work. Work for God. Before we get to worship, we'll talk about work. <sighs> young men, young women, if you're able to work, go to work. Go get your job. Learn some skills. Take some responsibilities. Get better at something. Start somewhere. Hard work goes a long, long way for a successful life. Yes. And all the moms and dads say, Amen. 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 I do not want to be paying for your cell phone bill when you're 35 years old. I don't want to be paying your insurance deductible when I'm 40 years old. Go get you a job and go to work. And if you don't like the job you have, work hard and believe God for a better job. Amen. But God created us to work. Can you say amen? amen? Amen. Adam and Eve, in the very beginning, they had this garden before them. They had access to every resource God had. And he said, you have a responsibility. If you want access to these resources, tend to my garden. Take care of it. God did not establish this world system as a welfare state to take care of those that don't want to go get a job. Well, that's harsh. Well, I'm talking biblical. Can you say amen? That God created his man and his woman for work and out of that work become, comes worship. Can you say amen? God said, here's this garden. You guys take care of it. You take care of this world. Have dominion. Go to work. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23. It says, and whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord, not to men. Knowing that you, knowing that from the Lord, knowing that from the Lord, you will receive the reward of your inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. 
but he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. And whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. There's been certain times in my profession, in my, in my, my uh, Monday through Friday vocation, where it's like, I don't want to do it for the CEO. I don't want to do it for the COO. I don't want to do it for the director of operations. I don't want to do it for this vice president. I don't want to do it for that because those guys sometimes don't know what they're talking about at all. They know what they know, but the things they don't know, they think they know, and they still don't know them. <laughs> so how do you keep moving forward? Whatever I do, I'm going to do it unto the Lord Amen. and for his glory. If they're asking me for it, I'm going to go ahead and do it, and I'm going to do it as unto the Lord. And I'm going to do it as an act of service and worship to God first and foremost because I'm serving someone greater and bigger than anybody that has a three-letter acronym at the end of their name. For the Christian, there's one person at the top of the org chart, and his name is Jesus. And I've known this through my own experience, that when I've done things as unto the Lord, I'll get the recognition and reward that my heart deserves. And it may not be from men, but it surely comes from God. And we have a generation of people that don't want to grow up and get out of their mom and dad's basements and go to work. If one thing that, that the COVID pandemic taught is that people can stay home and they'll get a check. We're created to work. Let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10. Remember, we're still talking about purpose. Second Thessalonians 3 and 10 says this, For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will work, neither shall he... Oh, not work, sorry. That not's an important one. <laughs> <laughs> For even when we were with you, we commanded you, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. You don't work, you don't eat. You don't work, you don't eat. So go get a job if you need a job. Can you say amen? But it's, it's, it's food service. And it's low wage. And it's kind of humiliating. It's entry level. Well, talk to some of the folks that you think are successful in life. And find out where they started. Burger King. McDonald's. Digging ditches. Picking up trash. Like, like if you go work for Brother Ken back in the day, sometimes the job was, hey, we're going to go dig this hole. <laughs> what are we going to do after that? Well, we're not going to talk about what's after that until we're done digging the hole. <laughs> well, when do we get break? Well, when we get in the truck, we'll have break when we get in the truck, when we're going to dig the other hole. <laughs> well, what about lunch? You, you, We'll get around to eating eventually. <laughs> but that's kind of, that's kind of, well, I, giving somebody their, their McDonald's order, let me just say this, like you have 50 orders that come in 15 minutes and you got to have near 100% accuracy and you got to figure out how to show up work on time every day in a team environment with people that are whacked out in their mind management who is undertrained and underpaid uh, with consumers that have high expectations that they're looking for fine dining and they're, they're spending $10 on an extra value meal. 
And what you are learning is in your entry level job is how to be a team player, how to control your emotions, how to serve somebody, how to, how to take something uh, that is humble, that humbles you and turn it into something that you can appreciate. And you may only need to do it for a season, but if you're not willing to do that even for a few weeks or a few months or even a year, how do you expect to be sitting in a corner office with giant windows and six weeks of PTO and matching 401k and have all these people that you're making decisions for? It does not work that way. Well, I want to be an operator and run my own business. This is what I know about people running their own business. I want to be an entrepreneur because I see them flying all over the country and taking exotic vacations and doing this. All the guys that I know that have ran their own business, they work 60 to 80 hours a week every single week week that work starts when they wake up at six o'clock in the morning and it ends when they go to bed at 10 o'clock at night and you talk about days off they don't have any but i want to fly jets you can't even make your bed (laughs) and you want to go do this you want to run your own business you don't even know how to run a coffee maker If you don't work, you don't eat. I want extra time off. Well, you got to have time to get time off. And until you do time, you don't get time off. We show up and we go to work. Young ladies, make sure the guy that gets your number has a job, a car, and a Bible. That is, that's the bare minimum for anybody that wants my daughter's snap. Just saying. A car, a, a bare minimum. Very bare minimum. She's got high taste. She wants a giant white SUV that goes for about $80,000 right now. So any of those guys out there that think my daughter's cute, you better plan on making about $250,000 a year just to support her. She likes hair. She likes makeup. She likes pretty things. She ain't going to be cheap. I know. It was cheap. It became cheaper for me when she went back to school. During the summer, that girl nearly broke us. (sighs) So when, when there's guys that think she's cute, they better have a car, a job, and a Bible. A Bible for our sake, and he better have a car and a job because he will not be able to keep up with her. And other young ladies, make sure you weed them out too. Can you say amen? If you're taking them on a date to Subway so they can turn in an application, find a new guy. If he smells like Axe body spray to cover up the vape in his car of his 2008 Dodge Charger, find a different guy. Find a guy that's ready to work. And let me say this to the ladies. If you got a man in your life that's working, appreciate him. Appreciate him. Appreciate him. Like, it's okay to make his lunch occasionally or cook him dinner. Appreciate him. If he's a blue-collar guy, even if he's going to a white-collar place, like all the guys in here that are even white collar that work office jobs, most of them are blue collar by heart. Appreciate them. Guys, if you got a gal that's out there working a full-time job, appreciate her. I loved it when my wife was making more money than I was. I thought every guy needs a, g- a girl that makes more money than she, he does. I thought it was awesome. I d- she's almost there. She's catching up again. Praise God. <laughs> she deserves it. I'm believing that she passes me up soon <sighs> because we got things we want to buy. Um, if you got people in your life that work, appreciate them. A couple more, a few more things, and we're close. I hope this. I hope this has been okay this morning. Hallelujah. We clo- Not only do we walk with God, we talk to God, we work for God, but we worship God. Let's look at Psalm 34. 
we sang this this morning. This is the one we sang this morning. And Pastor Lori and I, we did not collaborate on this at all, did we, Pastor Lori? Psalm 34. We're created to worship. One of our purposes in life. I'll bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. The poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and he saved him out of all his troubles. And the angel of the Lord encamps around all those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you as saints. There is no want to those who fear him. Psalm 9 says this, I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell of your marvelous works. In Exodus chapter 15, if you're taking notes, read these this, this week. As the children of Israel are cross over on the Red Sea after Pharaoh's army is consumed, there's, a, there's praise for deliverance. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and the rider thrown into the sea. There's time to praise God because of deliverance. Mary's song in Luke chapter 1, Mary praises God for his goodness. That God looked on Mary and had favor. And she sang. There's a reason we sing. Because there's, there's only a couple things, there's only three things I've ever sang for in my life. I do, I, I am, I do not have a good singing voice. I'm not trained at all. I don't even have a good choir voice. Pastor Nate will go like, hey, they can sing. They got a good choir voice. I don't even have a good choir voice. Don't even, and we've tried. We've tried. It's not good. There's a reason I play a bass. Because even if I could sing, the bass would drown it out. Or if I, the bass drowns it out even though I can't sing. A couple things I've sang for. I sang a song for my wife once. Once. I know, and I'm not going to sing it for you. It was terrible. But she appreciated it in the moment. <laughs> you remember that, don't you? Yeah. It left a lasting impression. That's how... <laughs> I'd sing for my daughter when I'd lay her down at sleep when she was a toddler because she asked for it. And I'll sing to my God. That's who I sing for. I don't sing for y'all. I don't get paid to sing. In fact, we could take up an offering for me to not sing. <laughs> not only is there praise for God's goodness and God's deliverance, but Paul and Silas lifted up midnight praise. And God heard their praise as they sang their hymns. And every jail cell was opened. And all who were imprisoned were set free. And the jailer who was about ready to lay on his own sword... Paul and Silas stopped him. And the jailer asked the most important question, what must I do to be saved? Paul and Silas' answer was perfect. Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved and your household. And we close with continuous praise. We'll close with this scripture. Revelation chapter 5, verse 11. Revelation chapter 5, verse 11. Verse 
were made to worship because there's continuous praise. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels. Around the throne, the living creatures and the elders and the numbers of them were ten thousands times ten thousands and thousands and thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. We're made to worship. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done here in this earth as it is in heaven. Heaven is a tabernacle that's filled with praise. Our hearts should align with heaven as well. Can you say amen? amen. Filled with praise. Romans 12 and 1. My all-time favorites, one of my all-time favorite scriptures. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service of worship. Find purpose in worship. We are created to worship. Regardless of our talents, our abilities, our giftings, we are created to worship. So we find our purpose in these four things. You walk with God. Walk with Him. If you've been far from, the, far from God and you haven't been walking with Him, Today's your day of salvation. It's time to walk with God. Well, it's been a long time. Well, he's been waiting for you, and here he is. You walk with God. You talk with God. Cry out to him. He'll listen, and he'll attend to your prayers. But I don't know what to say. Well, he already knows where your heart is. But I think there's something, there's a huge advantage to putting words to where your heart is. Even if it's God help, I need you. We walk with God, we talk to God, we work for God. Everything I do, everything I say is to bring glory to him. I work for him. And out of all that, I worship him. Because he's good and his mercy endures forever. Let's bow our heads. If you've been far from God and you need to come close to Him, if you've been walking from Him, He's not necessarily asking you to walk to Him. He's right there waiting for you. If you need to start walking with God again, I want you to raise your hand. Get Him up. You felt the presence of God. You've been convicted. You're that person that came in here God, oh man, God's going to show up. He's going to expose me. Today's your day of salvation. You've said, I'm going to wait too many times. Next time, next time, next week, next month, next year. You've been saying that for years. It's time to quit saying that and say, here I am, Lord. Make me whole again. If you need to get right with the Lord, I want you to raise your hand right now. Hallelujah. Anyone else? Anyone else? It's time. It's time to find your purpose again your reason to wake up in the morning. Hallelujah. I want everybody to pray these prayers. Pray this prayer. Hallelujah, Lord. I love you. And I give you everything. All that I am, everything that I have is yours. Today, Lord, I thank you that you've invited me back into your presence. Help me, Lord, to follow you all the days of my life. Jesus, I'm never letting go. I put my full trust in you. Deliver me from my fear. Heal my brokenness. Restore my soul. 
give purpose to my life again. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Before we close, this one last one. If you've if you found yourself off course without purpose, I want to pray for those without purpose this morning. You feel like you've lost it. You feel like you're not where you're, you should be, not where you want, you're not headed in the direction you want to go. If that's you this morning, I want you to raise your hand. We're not going to call everybody up all, all over the place, but I want to, as an acknowledgement, raise your hand. You, you love the Lord, but you need to find that purpose, that ignition point again. Raise your hand up. Hallelujah. There's several of them in our, here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for my friends, Lord God. Lord God, I thank you that your spirit is upon them, Lord God, and I thank you that they've responded to your conviction, Lord God. And I thank you that as their hearts are changed, Lord God, that the evidence is there of new fruit in their life, Lord God. Lord God, I thank you that you give people direction, clarity. Lord God, I thank you that you give my friends peace, Lord Jesus, that passes all understanding. Lord God, that guards their hearts and minds, Lord God, I thank you for renewed vigor, Lord God, and I thank you that clouds of oppression, of depression, of anxiety have to go in Jesus' name, Lord God. I thank you for the revelation power of the Holy Spirit, Lord God, that opens the eyes of our hearts, Lord God, so that we can see your goodness, Lord God. Lord God, I thank you for renewed purpose, Lord God, that we're here for a reason and you've called us out for a purpose. Lord God, I bless my friends now in Jesus' name, Lord God. May your face shine upon them, Lord God. May you may your be an ever-present help in their time of need. May you be the one who guards their right and left, their front and their back, Lord God. May, they be the one, may you be the one on whom you, they call. Lord God, bless them now, Lord God, and bless this our family here in this place. Bless this congregation of witnesses, Lord God. Lord God, we, we're stronger together and we need you now more than ever. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hallelujah. You are dismissed. Shake a hand, hug a neck. It's good to see some of my friends back here this morning. Be blessed. Love the Lord. We'll see you back here tonight for men's and women's at six o'clock.